In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But now, in this present situation, it is our trial, it is our tribulation. Another mountain to climb, another road to travel, and this fortress of ours cannot withstand the battle. Broken. Lost. Forgotten. But take a step back. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The same God that spoke the universe into existence, he knows your heart and he calls you by name. Come home, my child. Different colors, different races, different people, different faces. So pay attention and look closely. A man stands out in the waves. You can't see his face, but you know him by name. All of humanity lines the shore, kneeling before him, Jesus. God sent his only son wrapped in flesh down to earth to look you in your eye and show you your worth. He hung on the cross for the whole world to see. Sin shackled your body, but your soul is set free. No more pain, no more suffering, no more loss, no more grief. Jesus walked out the grave and he locked up the thief. Now, united as one, we stand here together. United as one, we praise him. Forever. Good evening. How are you guys doing? One more time. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Better. Good. All right. So I'm Miguel Chavez or Chavis, like my mom calls me. Um, whatever you want to call me is fine. Um, I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Originally, I was sitting in the same seats that you are sitting in now. I uh, went to Clemson University 2007 and graduated 2014. Um, <laughs> some stuff happened. I had some stuff going on. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I'm, I'm the player development coach for our defense now. Uh, okay, and so uh, proud of those guys, man. We just had a pretty, pretty good year. Uh, it was a really, really, really good year. Yeah, that's cool. Um, uh, actually, my favorite sport isn't football at all. It's basketball. Uh, yeah, some of you, some of you have seen me play basketball, uh, and you're praying for my repentance and soul right now. And so, thank you for that. Um, but I just want to introduce my family real quick, if I can. Oh, there's my family. Look at that. Some of you are probably wondering where in the heck they found pajamas for that guy. It's like a 4XT lady pajama I got on. Uh, and then, then there we are not being cheesy and uh, awkward. My son, that's, when we tell our son, uh, my son, to smile, that's what he gives us right there. Uh, he gives us this upside down smile. I can't do that if I tried. I don't know how he does that. But that's Judah Paul. Uh, he's three years old. And uh, that's Thomas Calvin right there, the one just happy to be alive. Um, he is 11 months old. And uh, this is, uh, once you have two, you're just like, whatever. And then uh, this is Megan McCoy Chavis, and she's right down here. This is my wife. And, um, yeah. And so, yeah, cool story. I actually met her at Clemson. And uh, she was actually one of the people, she, we weren't missionary dating or anything, but we, I was a fake believer and she was like rebuking me in my sin one day, which is really, really crazy because she's an introvert and she really doesn't do that. And then I walked away and I was like, I'm barking up the wrong tree out of that one. And uh, Jesus saved me on January 31st. Um, and two weeks later, I sent her two dozen roses and I told her I loved her and I was going to marry her. And uh, it worked out, guys. Yeah, come on. Come on. Get you some of that. She was, we were kind of just joking. You know, like friends. Is anybody watching The Bachelor right now, by the way? Anybody? Okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Yes, I am. 
Yes, I am. My wife has girls' night. We, we're, all, we're Christians. We really are Christians, okay? We just like The Bachelor. My, girl, uh, my wife has girls' night, and then I just like, oh, yeah, I think I'll just stay around, you know? And, uh, but they use, like, these, these weird phrases for love, uh, and it's just like, uh, uh, this is my favorite one. You ready for this? I am 100% confident to tell you that I'm falling in love with you. <laughs> what does that mean, bro? <laughs> huh? um, but I knew, I knew, uh, and then someone said, you know, and then, and then did you, anybody see the last episode? Does anybody know what happens? I'm not going to ruin it. But do you remember what my, my, our girl Cassie told him? She said, I love you. I hate, don't you hate to hear this one, guys? This, like, sucks, doesn't it? I love you. but I'm not in love with you? And then you go into the friend zone forever? Well, like, Megan was, like, talking to me. Like, she's like, you know, oh, you love me, don't you, Miguel? And I was like, yes, I do. (laughs) And she knew that I was not talking about no friend zone, okay? I was talking about some covenant, something holy. Come on. And uh, and I told her, listen, guys, I'm just going to keep it straight. Hey, listen, girls, this is a quick aside. This isn't in my notes. FCA people, you got to give me like seven extra minutes, okay? But listen, I'm telling you, this whole idea of girls like bad guys is bull crap, man. That's bull crap. Don't be a jerk. Don't Google and goggle with the other guys over girls and, and, and objectify them. Look her dead in the face and say, I love you, and I'm not going anywhere until the cops come get me and see what happens. <laughs> see what happens. It might be attractive. Okay? It might be attractive. You might go to jail, or you might get a wife. So, there you go. It t- hey, listen, hey, listen, listen, listen. It took her a couple of months, but this is what I did. I was like, listen. I was like, listen, I love you. I'm going to marry you. I just became a Christian. She was fine. She was godly. That's all I needed to know. Okay? I was like, I love you. I'm going to marry you. Don't say it back. Shh. Shh. I'll wait for you. And like, it took like four months, but boom. Two kids later, we're, th- we're in there. Seven years. So praise the Lord. Um, yeah, amen. One more time. Come on. Hey, I really didn't plan on that. My wife's going to kill me. But the guy you're seeing today, I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner, man. I'm a sinner. You can ask my disciples. We go to Cross Point Church, and we, we lead a small group of college students and young pros. Ask them. They've seen it in our lives. You've seen it on the basketball court if you see me play at all. All right. I'm a sinner, man, and I'm in need of God's grace. But the dude standing here today and th- that guy that was up there, you don't have to put that back up, but the guy that was up there with this amazing wife and, and two kids, it's not the same dude I used to be. Straight up. It's not the same guy I used to be. All right? And so the way I was raised, man, is just a, a crazy household, honestly. Uh, we loved each other. Uh, some of y'all got some crazy families, too. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, you might hug each other or fight during Thanksgiving. That's kind of my family. Uh, but that we loved our craziness. Uh, it kind of like it is our everything, you know. And but growing up, man, I'm a multiracial dude. My mom's white. My dad's Native American and African American. And, and growing up, I was like, man, where do I fit? I really resonated with Eminem growing up in 8 Mile. Like, that was my joint. Um, like, straight up, like, dyed the hair blonde, like, hoodie. Like, like you only get one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. <laughs> like, like, wife beater, hoodie on. Like, just mad. Like, on my birthday, like, blowing out the candles, mad. <laughs> You know, just, like, thugging it up and, like, and, and really trying to identify, you know, with race and culture and socioeconomics, man, those things are, are not synonymous all the time. But try, where do I fit, man? And who am I? And, and, and my dad was not in the home. I was raised by my mom. Who's affirming me as a man? And, and how do I relate to women and other people? And got to college and was, was fortunate enough to play football here at Clemson. And was uh, Sigma Chi. Uh, here at Clemson, and man, just fell in love with the idea of popularity and being known and accepted uh, and sexual immorality and the pleasures of, of physical intimacy before marriage and pornography and everything. Man, I was eating up the world. I was eating up the world. Do whatever, say whatever, think of me whatever, as long as I get to enjoy this world. 
And I was a cultural Christian. I, I gave my life, I said a prayer of repentance, a, or a prayer of uh, asking the Lord to my heart twice, and I, I did not count the cost. And it was not real. I came to FCA, and I, and I raised my hands, and I sat next to somebody. It was not real. It was not of my heart. And God messed me up, and I heard the gospel. Man, and this, this, this eternal love that he's always had for me, he brought me to faith in himself, to belief. He took the, the scabs off my eyes. He, he showed me my sin. He showed me what a mess I was and that he still chose me. He still sent his son to die for me, and he still loved me, and I could come ugly and messed up, and I was his, and he was mine. And that messed my life up. And so I became a Christian. And I emailed the only girl I knew that was a real Christian. And I, I emailed her. And I didn't text her because I wasn't trying to slip in her DMs. I didn't know how Christians talk to girls. Straight up. True story. You can ask her. It's like, true story. I was like, I don't know. What, what do Christian guys do? I guess they send emails. They don't text. <laughs> and so I just sent her an email. And I was like, and honestly, and you can ask her. Like, this is like, true story, true story. I was ready to become celibate and, like, go up into the mountain somewhere with my Bible and Jesus and, like, live off the Bible forever. And, like, I really was, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest, you can ask her. I really wasn't trying to hit on her. I really wasn't trying to come after her. I was just saying, man, thank you for rebuking me and showing me Jesus. But he saved me. And he had other plans. Praise the Lord, I didn't become celibate and become a monk. Um, and he had other plans. But I say all that to say... Man, I became a Christian. I went to Walmart. I bought a journal because I saw a YouTube video of Christians journaling. And then, true story, I'm just trying to work it out, man. I'm being honest with you. And I was like, man, what do I do now? All right, what do I do now? And for y'all here in a group this big, in this Christian awesome culture we got going on, man, the Lord's blessed Clemson, South Carolina, amen, okay? But I'm telling you, from the believers and people that I've seen fall away from the Lord to people who have not considered their cost, you need to consider the cost. Okay, so tonight, it's a long intro, I know, I know. But tonight, stay with me, get your phones out, turn your freaking notifications off. All right, get a Bible, get something, get, open up your ears, give your hearts to me, please. We're going to look at the cost of coming to Jesus, okay? Y'all with me? Okay, here we go. The cost of coming to to Jesus. It's Luke 14, 25 through 33. That's Luke 14, 25 through 33. We're going to read the first two verses. All right, that's four, four truths for you to know. And then I'll give you my email at the end of this. Afterwards, I'll be hanging out down here. And if you want this whole sermon, just the scriptures to meditate on, I'm, a, I'm going to kind of give it to you David Platt style. You guys know who that is? Secret church, some of you have never heard of that, you're unbelievers, you're just you're new to Christianity, you're just seeking, you're like, secret church, these guys are weirdos. <laughs> it's awesome. All right, and I'm going to go here for a little bit, okay, so just stay with me by God's grace. Here we go. So the first point, the cost of coming to Jesus, you have to hate your family. You have to hate your family. Verse 25 and 26. Now great crowds accompanied him, Jesus. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Right? So the context of this is he just talked about this great, great banquet where all these people were going to be coming to him and feasting with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. And so many people were coming to Jesus because he was healing them by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raising them from the dead. He was healing their sicknesses. So he was, man, he was feeding like 5,000 people with like two and a half fish and some bread. Okay? And, and so they're, 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 I just imagine walking around and a group large, this is following somebody. And I imagine he just stops and he looks at them. This big group who's used to getting stuff from him. And, 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 and lest they confuse what it takes to follow Jesus, he says, you cannot come to me unless you hate your mom and dad. You hate your brother. And you hate your sister. Yes, you have to hate your own life if you're going to come to me. And you imagine the crowd hearing that. This is the Jewish community. This is, this is Clemson, South Carolina, right? Some of you Yankees are like, oh, I don't care about family right here. Right? Family, grandma. 
right? This is Clemson, South Carolina. We love our family, don't we, in the South? And Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us you have to hate your family if you're going to come to him. All right, now let's look at that and unpack that. What, is it, what does he mean? What does our Lord mean? So family is a gift of God, yes, right? Family is good. But this, this hate your family is a Semitic ex- expression where they, the hearers then would have understood perfectly. We got, kind of get confused now, but it means to love less. That what Jesus is saying is that your love for him should, should far surpass so much your families that your love and allegiance to your family looks like hate. All right, so my family. I told y'all we were crazy, a bunch of crazy liberal Democrats, multiracial, uh, some homosexual, some pantheist, some, you know, I was a Muslim in eighth grade for like two hours after watching the movie Ali. Um, you know, we just, we just go around affirming each other. But, but truly, I mean truly, we might get in fights. You know, some of you have these families like mine. When, when Meg and I got married, uh, I would just yell all the time. And she would be like crying. And she's like, why do you talk to me this way? I was like, I just, I love you. I'm just excited about the conversation. That was the family I was raised in, right, where everything seems like an argument and a fight because we, and and, and at the end of the day, we had each other. We would say that blood is thicker than water. Well, here, Jesus is talking about something that's thicker than blood. He's talking about him, allegiance and his love for him. And so when I became a Christian, you know, it wasn't long until, I read in the Bible about what our Lord says about sexual immorality and or homosexuality or or anything of anything any topic found in His Word. And my little brother, um, who I love, who I adore, uh, Adam Crawford Chavis, was a, the best athlete out of all three boys. My big brother played basketball. I played football professionally in college. My little brother was a ballet dancer, and he is incredible, like incredible, like. Not like my physique. Don't imagine me in, in tights. That's not, the, that's not the right image you should have. I'm sorry if I gave you that image. Um, but just beautiful, beautiful person, a beautiful body, and just athletic, man. Like, I'm like boohoo and crying out at, at watching his, his, his ballet. And, but he asked me, he said, he said, Miguel, he wanted to know. You don't, you don't believe what those crazy Christians believe about marriage, do you? That is, that's between one man and a woman? And y'all, I'm telling you, I spent, if we talked for 50 minutes, I spent 45 minutes talking about my sin, 45 minutes talking about my fallings and, and, and my shortcomings and struggles, and five minutes talking about the biblical doctrine of marriage, of a man and a woman that God made perfectly together to express the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my brother called me a bigot. My brother said I was unloving. He said my ideas were archaic, and he didn't talk to me for almost a year. My baby brother. And I'm sitting here crying. Is this worth it? My sister, his his twin sister is also um, a homosexual sky. Love her. She was my best friend growing up, man. They might be watching this. She was my best friend growing up. And um, we do not have the same relationship that we used to. But I got Jesus. I got Jesus. My, 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 my dad, he found out that I was taking my wife and that kid with the frown and some of these people actually here. We, we took a group to Honduras on mission. You guys are you guys going to Philly next weekend, right? Right? You guys are going what? Hey, listen, don't waste time in Philly. Don't have fun in Philly. Don't waste your money and your parents' money and the money that, that you raised to go to Philly. Some secular atheist uh, philanthropist can do that. Preach the gospel in Philly. Lay hands on people in Philly. Bring the kingdom in Philly. Let the spirit reign in Philly. Don't fall into sexual morality in Philly. Don't get drunk in Philly. Don't embarrass Christ in Philly. Change Philly. Go make disciples. 
And, and we wanted to do that in Honduras. I told my dad I was taking my pregnant wife during the time of the Zika virus to Honduras to make disciples because people were dying and going to hell. And they needed the gospel because that was the only salvation for them. And my dad said that I was in a cult. He said that I was not his son and that I had lost my mind. My dad, my daddy. But I have Jesus. Now, do I, does that mean that your relationships with your parents and your mothers and your brothers and sisters will, will just be screwed and be bad for the rest of your life? No. But, but if push comes to shove and you have to choose Jesus or your parents, you better choose Jesus. That's what he's saying. That Miguel Chavis, if you have to give up Adam and Sarah and Lisa and Aaron and Diane and Al and Carol, you give them all up for me because I am worthy. And this family, the family that I have, that woman that's sitting down there, as beautiful and as amazing, as much as I treasure this woman right here and my two sons, compared to Jesus, my love for them has, has to look like hate. Are you with me? It's the cost of following Jesus. Number two, you got to pick up your cross if you want to come to Jesus. Pick up your cross. Verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his or her own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So I want to tell you what this doesn't mean. Bearing your cross does not mean to think ill of yourself or to hate yourself. All right, just to say, oh, this is my cross to bear. That's satanic. That's not a right thought. Or it doesn't mean to become a monk in the mountains like I was headed to be. Or to literally die and become a martyr. But it might mean that. It might mean that. It means for you to give up your self-determination and to gain dependence and obedience to Jesus. This is what this means. It means that there is no salvation without sacrifice. Now, sacrifice equals success, not prosperity, especially when you sacrifice for others. When you lose and they win at your expense, you are never more like Jesus than at the moment when another gains good from your loss. This is what this means. This is Jesus. This is what he did for all of us. There's no better section of scripture that illustrates this truth than Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Listen to this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his or her own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Yes, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Donald Trump, Dabo Sweeney, Miguel Chavis, you put the name, there's no name higher than the name of Jesus. He has the highest name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here's a question. How are you doing at picking up your cross? I mean, there's a lot of blessings to be a member of FCA and to come here on Thursday nights and to have small groups and live in Clemson, South Carolina. But if your Christian walk does not consist of a daily cross, I would say you're not living like Jesus. How can you pick up your cross? you got to pick up your cross if you're going to come to him. There's no coming to Jesus without a cross. To be a Christian is to suffer and sacrifice. A student is not greater than his master, is what Jesus said. Pick up your cross. Number three, count the cost. Verse 28 through 32. 
He continues on. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Jesus gives us two illustrations that gets his points across. Building a house and going to war. Of another one. Uh, we had a football player recently um, leave the team not too long ago in the past couple of years. I won't say any names. Um, but I've seen tons of guys do it. As a coach, I've seen tons of guys do it, okay. And they get there, and they're all jacked up, and there's some five-star, right? And they're about to come uh, take on the world and start their, like, first practice ever at Clemson. I thought that. And they realize, like, holy crap, i got to put in, like, 40 to 50 hours of work a week. i got to go to class. i got to talk to my girlfriend back home. i got a, a, a learning specialist. i got a tutor. i got an academic advisor. i got to try to find some kind of social life. Then i got to eat and maybe watch some YouTube videos at night. And they go, this is too much. I don't want this, I don't want this, and they leave. They did not count the cost. How about people that come into Clemson that want to be engineers? Whew, good Lord. Some of y'all feel me right now. Some of y'all like, yeah, I'm in sociology now. <laughs> Nothing against sociology, I love sociology. To love theology is to love sociology, but to just better, right? I'm telling you, especially football players, they come in to be engineer majors, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to practice. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to be an engineer. It lasts like two and a half weeks. They're like, can I get a comm? Can I get a comm major or something? <laughs> no offense to my comm majors. Parks and Rec? <laughs> Let's keep it 100 real quick, okay? If your major is Parks and Rec, you're killing life right now, by the way. <laughs> Mine was political science, so all we did was argue, write papers, and never said anything objective. And uh, I got a degree. <laughs> got a degree. All right, but I got a sister who's actually here tonight, a uh, sister in the Lord. She's like our daughter slash sister slash Judah's godmother slash whatever role. You know, you Christians know what I'm talking about. We get in relationships, you're just like... I don't know what to call that person. I love him. And, uh, but man, she had to count the cost when she was going to get her doctorate to become a doctor. And she's going through it right now. She has to count the cost. It's very, very hard. I had to count the cost when I asked Megan to be my wife. What would that mean? Two sinners in the same house and bed? Hair everywhere. Like, bruh, everywhere. I go throughout my day, and I'm pulling hair out of my boxers. How is there hair in my boxers? You go in, your, you go in the shower, and it looks like a squirrel. It's just right there <laughs> on the shower. Because girls, for some reason, y'all think it's a brilliant idea to not let it run down the drain. So I'm going to put the squirrel right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You too, long hair guy. You too, right there. Yeah, you, you Jesus, yeah. There's a squirrel, a squirrel right there, okay. What is that? What is that thing? This means I would never be with another woman, woman intimately other than her. This means that I get her body and soul and mind and spirit and strengths and weaknesses and I get no one else. You're going to count the cost. And, and listen to me. Coming to Jesus is even far greater than that. You've got to count the cost. You've got to know what it's going to cost you. It might cost you family. It might cost you your life. You've got to count the cost. Because I'm telling you, almost all of you will move out of this Christian bubble. And you're going to go to a place where people really don't care if you're a Christian or not. 
And you have to decide, am I going to follow Jesus through those times or not? There were two times that I didn't count the cost as a pre-Christian. I didn't think about what I had to give up. I, I set up a sinner's prayer one time when I was in high school. I was at military school. It will drive you to say a sinner's prayer. And then another time at a mega church, and I just had an emotional experience, man. Emotional experience. And, and listen, I love emotions. Like, as you could probably tell, I love emotions. I cry all the time. Like, all the time. Okay? Like LeBron James. Yeah, 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 that's my boo. He won the championship at Cleveland. That's my wife. She has a video of it. Crying. All right, I'm emotional, man. The, the cats and dogs commercials. In the arms of an angel. Oh, if I away. Those don't make me cry. LeBron James makes me cry. Okay? And I love emotions, but I'm telling you, with this greater worship, I told my wife, I said, man, this is good worship music. And, and this group here, and things are done excellently. What I'm just warning you against is make sure you count the cost when you're coming to Jesus. Don't make everything just an emotional choice, an emotional response. Actually think about what it's going to cost you to give it up. Lastly, give up everything. Give up everything. Verse 33. If you're going to come to Jesus, you got to give up everything. So therefore, if any of you who does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. This is the message that Jesus has been saying all throughout the book of Luke. All throughout it. He goes and meets um, uh, Matthew the tax collector. He says, get up, follow me. Matthew leaves being a tax collector. He goes and calls brothers who are fishermen. He says, come and follow me. They leave their dad, which means leaving their prosperity, which means leaving their prospects, which means leaving their money. And they go and follow Jesus, a rich young man who's really, really religious. And, and he goes to FCA every Thursday night. And he's part of an FCA small group and a, and a New Spring small group and a Cross Point serve team and um, uh, prays for the martyrs. And, and there's like three Bible studies a day, the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the Psalms. Um, and, and, and hands out soup and, and bread, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. He says, oh, Lord, I've obeyed the commandments. And Jesus said, fine. And just sell everything you have and come follow me. And the rich young ru ruler hung his head and walked away. Because what was Jesus getting to? He says, man, it's easy to obey Externally, give me your heart. Give me everything. Give me your passions. Relinquish everything for me. And follow me. I'm greater. And the man could not do it. Y'all, I had to give up everything to come to Jesus. My political allegiance. My passions. My sexuality. No longer can I be, be controlled by my lust and what pleased me. All right? Your college students. You are college students. There's no other way for me to say this. I'm not trying to be inappropriate. You're horny. You're college students. You want to have sex. Guess what? That's a good thing. In the Christian circles, we kind of, we kind of like uh, demonize our sexuality. No, praise God, man. Sex is awesome. Ser and some of y'all are uncomfortable as heck right now. Some of you are uncomfortable with it because you've never heard that before. So you don't know what to do with your sexuality. Some of you are uncomfortable because you're having sex with the person you're sitting next to. And the Holy Spirit is convicting your butt off. Facts. Facts. But your sexuality is used according to God's word. Listen to me. So what does that mean? That means just if, I'm, if I'm tempted towards homosexuality, I can't give in to that desire just because that would please me or my, that would please my flesh. Well, that's what I think is right. That means that I want to hook up with, with 20 different girls. I can't do that because that's not what God has described. That's not God's desire for you. That's not God's will for your life. So guess what? Prepare, save, get ready to use your sexuality with your spouse and enjoy it. By God's grace. Enjoy it with your spouse. Don't sacrifice. Don't, don't, don't uh, covet and hold on to it. You have to relinquish everything. 
when you become a Christian. And some of you need to hear this tonight. Your sexual immorality is going to keep you from seeing God. I know we're laughing and joking, but do not miss this. You cannot claim Christ and think you're going to hold on to your closet sexual morality. You cannot have both. You cannot. You have Christ, we have your desires. Relinquish everything. I had to give up my education. No longer is my education the greatest thing in the world. I was going to the NFL. No longer is being an NFL star the greatest thing in the world. My family, my future. And after it all, I promise you, listen, I'm here to tell you today, believe me or don't believe me, but I'm being honest, I found that Jesus is worth it. He is worth it to give up everything. So why is the cost of coming to Jesus worth it? And I'm just going to roll off here. Because when you come to Jesus, you get God. John 1, 1, 5, and 14, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. When you come to Jesus, you get God. Number two, because when you come to Jesus, you experience true love. 1 John 4, 7 through 10, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You come to Jesus, you get love. Because when you come to Jesus, you get the best friend you can possibly ever have. John 15, 13 through 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Number four, when you come to Jesus, you get purpose. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Number five, when you come to Jesus, you get forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, as a sinner, I need that truth. Number six, when you come to Jesus, you get a new identity. You might like who you think, you might think you like who you are today. I'm telling you, if you come to Jesus and you mean it and you live for Jesus, the person that you'll become, you'll want to be that person and meet that person every single day. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you come to Jesus, you get a new family. Some of you lost family like me. Romans 8, 14 through 17, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provide we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. When you come to Jesus, you get everything. You get everything. Listen to this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Have you ever thought about that? When you come to Jesus, you get everything? Like forget national championships, man. Or forget getting the candidate that you voted for into the White House. Forget getting that that cute girl that you've been crushing on. When you come to Jesus, you get everything. He knows you. 
You get joy, you get peace, you get life, you get forgiveness. You will reign with God forever. All that is his will be yours. And all that he is will be you. You will be God's when you come to Jesus. If you don't come to Jesus, you have to live as your own God. You'll never know true love. You'll never know the best friend in the world. Your purpose will not be eternal. You'll miss out on this awesome and yet really imperfect family. You will not have your sins forgiven. You will live as a slave of sin, and you will never enjoy the new heavens and new earth. So come to Jesus. Every day, look at me, every day. Some of you for the first time need to come to Jesus tonight. And I pray that by the power of his Holy Spirit, he saves you right now. I pray that he would change your heart from faking it and acting like a cultural Christian to being a God lover who counted the cost and said, oh yeah, I want Jesus and I'll give up everything else. This verse summarizes everything I just said. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. You see that? I pray tonight that you have seen that Jesus is worthy. He's worth everything. He's worth the suffering. He's worth the, the you denying yourself. Is it, really, is it really worth denying myself with my sexual gratification and waiting? I hope tonight you'll see that Jesus is worth it. Is it really worth going to Philadelphia and, and, and being awkward and sharing this gospel message with people who might not know them and, and dirtying my hands and serving somebody else and giving up a week tonight? I hope by God's grace you've seen that Jesus is worth it. Follow him. Count the cost. And I pray every day that you guys always come to Jesus. Pray with me now. Jesus, you are the treasure that was buried in the field and then found. And all those who come by faith and repentance, Lord, and come to see that you are immeasurably more valuable than all that we've experienced in life, Lord. They, they bear you again and they go back and they sell all that they have just to have you, oh God. And God, I pray. I pray that everyone tonight will be motivated to come to Jesus because they've truly seen how valuable you are. Lord, I pray they will know they don't have, they don't have tomorrow. They don't have next week, Lord. They should not count slowness with God as we count slowness for you have been patient and slow so your patience will lead them to repentance. God, I pray that, that no one in this room would experience eternal death and judgment because they don't come to Jesus and lose all those things eternally that they were trying to fight for on this earth. But they be found in Jesus and actually experience the beauty and the peace and the joy and the life and the new identity that's found in being your disciple, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Work in our hearts now by your grace. Amen.